dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. The persuasive power of any falsehood lies in its proximity with the truth. Machiavelli's The Prince contains many truths and many statements which ring true to our practical ears. Chapter 22 concerning the secretaries of princes is a great example of this. In this chapter, we read many things that help us understand our role as servants against the backdrop of Machiavellian reasoning. Thank you again, everyone, for finishing out this course that we're doing together on Machiavelli. This will be the last one that we're doing, and I hope that you've enjoyed a little bit of what we've we've looked at. There's many things that are astounding in his work, The Prince, to our ears, but I want to underscore uh, something about this book. Today we read it, we're kind of like, okay, I understand it's pretty much the same thing over and over again. The end justifies the means so princes should take any kind of means necessary in order to stay in power. And the reason for that, the end justifying the means, is that it's a broken world. You know, and we should not try to be idealistic about a world that is broken. If we want to play with a broken world, we have to be willing to break the rules, right? And so that understanding of Machiavelli is kind of always the same. We, we want to be good. We know that we should be good, but hey, this world is tough, and if you want to win in it, then you got to play by its own rules and not by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you can understand why historically this caused a lot of consternation for the Catholic Church. The Trying to keep people's souls straight, they were like, this book is dangerous. And it took off. It knew a lot of acclaim and success. It became very controversial. Shakespeare quoted it many times. It was kind of a staple of almost like the thinking that we weren't supposed to have. And therefore, it was very appealing. Also, it was interesting because Machiavelli doesn't hesitate to cite examples from churchmen themselves who only prove his point by the example or the bad example of their lives. That, in fact, in order to lead and to maintain power, you have to be willing to compromise integrity and ethics. Well, let me just tell you, I don't think that this is the way to go. <laughs> because I don't think that Jesus Christ, who was the ruler of all, intended for his followers to do any less than he did. In fact, he commanded us to not be hypocrites like the Pharisees and the scribes and like, well, like the, even the rulers of this world. He says, you know, my followers are not rulers of this world. But then what are we supposed to do? Because we're called at the same time to make an impact. We're called to make an influence in this world. You are not here because you don't think it's important, your life is important, or that your choices ought to matter. You're here because you do, and I agree with you. I want to hone you to understand the impact of your life and to make it as influential as possible. That's why if you link it to the gospel and you take the sweet yoke of Jesus Christ upon your shoulders and you follow him in service, you will live and you will lead and you will reign with a greater span of influence than by any other means. And I mean that. Even if you were to have the most powerful position in the world and be president of the United States of America or president of the United Nations or whatever kind of worldly aspiration you could possibly have, it is nothing compared to the impact you could have as a father. And I really mean that. I want you to think about this very deeply. Is there anyone who has a greater influence than a mom, than a grandmother? Yeah. 
I, I, I challenge you here because on the outside, sure, you could have all, you could influence millions of people if you become a pop star. Yeah, but influence them at what level? You could influence them at the level of their passions, sure. At the level of their, of their thrill of their ears, sure. But that influence is so superficial. And in the end, if people followed you, they'd actually become bad, not good. Is this what you really want? Wouldn't you rather have a life spilled out into goodness that edifies, a, a life that inspires, a life that expands? See, when you, when you influence from the outside in, you influence in a way that confines. Getting people to be aroused in their passions, getting people to go after money, getting people, these are all things that are lesser things than, than the human spirit is capable of. And so if you think, well, my job is just to keep power and keep everything running in a state, it's almost like a father who says, my job is just to put meat on the table. She's like, no, your job is much more than to put meat on the table, my friend. Well, you're like, well, no, 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 that's what fatherhood is. I'm like, no, that's not what fatherhood is. And if all you're doing is teaching your children to eat meat, well, how have you really helped them? They're made for much greater things than eating meat. Have you inspired or led them to those greater things? To do that, you have to be a greater person. I can influence by an extended number of people by limiting the scope or the depth of my impact to things that are purely material. The more material that my impact is, the broader my sphere of influence can be. And I'm, I'm here to say, I'm glad that your sphere of influence is broad, but if it's not deep, to what avail is it after all? Christ is here calling us instead to be men and women who make an impact that is deep. Now, how do I do that? An impact that is deep comes from the relationship of the leader towards what is true, good, and beautiful. And when my heart is, uh, is drawn to those deeper things, the most essential aspect of my leadership is my alignment with those deeper things. I cannot lead in a way that is deeply impactful if I myself am compromised with respect to the goal towards which I'm leading. This is something Machiavelli doesn't even look at. He's concerned with princes keeping their power on their thrones, okay? I'd like to say I'm more interested in helping you to be those who build the thrones than, than those who simply sit upon them. What is the throne of my leadership? Where's the place where I'm going to really exert my influence as a leader? Is it, is it, is it just to have a place that everyone acclaims me as a position of power? If that's it, you're really thinking way too short of leadership. And that's my fundamental critique of Machiavelli. Not only is his thought skewed from any kind of moral basis, which is a pity, but also he's a truncated leader with a small vision of leadership. His, his idea of leadership is success with respect to your enemies. And he actually allows the, the enemies or those who would threaten your powerful position to be those who determine your action. I see this as cowardice. There's nothing creative about his vision of leadership here. Machiavelli is not setting forth a new vision that says, you know, here's the great things that you can achieve with your power, and therefore you have to align your character with what you do in order to make what you do shine forth with moral goodness. No, 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 he doesn't even look at that. He's really just saying, how can you defeat your enemies and stay in the position? And I just shake my head at that. And I say, Machiavelli, that's a very small, very pitiable vision of leadership. Wouldn't it be even better to have a leader, vision of leadership so powerful that you don't need a worldly throne or the opinions of others to exercise it? Would that my influence be independent of the opinions of men? How do I do that? How do I get a leadership that's absolutely impregnable to any kind of attack from the outside because it is so powerfully rich from the inside? This is where the gospel teaches us and what kind of leaders Christ wants to form. 
not men and women who are subject constantly to attack and have to defend themselves against every vicissitude of the modes of fashion in the world and the ways of thinking in the world of men. No, no, no. Instead, Christ wants to fashion men and women who will fashion this world in the image of God who is true, constant, and beyond any reproach. To do that, we have to have a very different vision of leadership than what he puts forth in the prince. We need to follow the prince, the Lord, in the gospel. And there we find an expansive, explosive, and timeless vision of a leader. And that's what I'm here to help you to learn. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org and subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. So I wanted to finish up our course here on Machiavelli with chapter 22, which is called Concerning the Secretaries of Princes. I think there's a lot of very interesting uh, insight here. And, and it's good for us to kind of finish a little bit more on a positive note. And to finish up with something other than all the Machiavellian reasonings that we've had hither to now. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Chapter 22, concerning the secretaries of princes. This will be the end of our study of Machiavelli, right? But it's just kind of a nice way to finish. Let's listen to, listen to what he says. The choice of servants is of no little importance to a prince, and they are good or not according to the discrimination of the prince. Well, that's a really important little statement there. He's basically going to say that you're going to be judged as a leader by your, the followers that you choose. Now, isn't that a thought for us? And isn't that true, you know, in the ways of the world? People look at you and they say, ah, look at how your kids are. That must be how you are. Or look at the people that you've hired, right? It, it's kind of, it never ceases to amaze me how, how many things an entrepreneur has to be good at to be successful. And if you miss any one of them, you jeopardize the success of your whole enterprise. It just amazes me. Which is one of the reasons why I want to reach out to Catholic entrepreneurs and just say thank you for what you do and to try to provide some sort of support for you from the, from the point of view of faith, because my goodness, the, the, you know, I, I myself am an entrepreneur and I've had so many advisors come and they always say the same things. Everything is absolutely necessary. Your marketing is necessary. Your branding is necessary. Your timing is necessary. And they'll have all kinds of, you know, if you don't nail this, then you're going to fail. If you don't do this right, you're going to fail. And one of the things that many people have told me over the years, oh my gosh, if you don't hire the right people, then you're going to fail. And you're just like, you know, there's, it's almost like if we ever succeed, it's a, just a miracle of grace, you know? And no wonder so few people try to be entrepreneurs because it'd be just be so much easier to not. When you realize you've got to nail everything, one of the things that people say over and over again is you've got to start with your people. It's all about your people. It's all, and I'm just like, the funny thing is, is people who say that, everyone is about their little angle. And when you're in charge of a business, you hear all the angles. It's about your accounting. It's about your development plan. It's about your branding. It's about your people, you know. And, and so here's Machiavelli pointing this out the same way. You know, he says, listen, the fact is, is he writes the first opinion which one forms of a prince and of his understanding is by observing the men he has around him. And when they are capable and faithful, he may always be considered wise because he has known how to recognize the capable and to keep them faithful. But when they are otherwise, one cannot form a good opinion of him for the prime error which he 
made was in choosing them. So Machiavelli's like, it's all about the people, right? You know, how do I find good people and then keep them? Now, I have to recognize capacity in somebody and then make them faithful to me. So in other words, it's, it's here Machiavelli is giving us a study for how you create and keep a staff or a team around you of highly capable people. So this is interesting, right? Like, so what would he say this way back in the 1500s? And we're going to find is that he says things that are basically very important for us today. And I want to then draw the conclusion for what it means for us who are following Christ. Because there we find it's a really interesting insight. The Machiavelli basically contradicts himself and, and shows maybe a spot where, well, his whole teaching is lacking substance. But let's go ahead and take a look here. First, he goes on, you know, and he says, so how, how do you do this, basically, right? And he says, there are three classes of intellects, one which comprehends by itself. Okay, so some people's minds are just able to understand. Okay? Another which appreciates what others have comprehended. Okay, so other people can read and say, oh my gosh, I now am learning thanks to you. So thank you for understanding now I'm going to learn from your understanding. And a third, which neither comprehends by itself, nor by the showing of others. The first is the most excellent, the second is good, and the third is useless. And by the intellect, the prince's job is to constantly be looking at the servant to make sure that the servant does what is right and, and doesn't do what is wrong. So the, the leader has to be better, or at least more alert, than those who serve him or her. Okay, so basically what this means is that it's a tough job being at the top. You have to constantly be on top. Otherwise, you're going to lose those who are serving you. So leaders have to therefore lead. If you're going to be the engine of the train, you've got to drive forward. And we have to be always pushing ourselves by the intellect towards the new things towards the new innovations, towards the new solutions, to moving the team forward in order to keep things in their right perspective. It might be hard, it might be thankless task, but it's what makes everything else function. As soon as the leader stops thinking or stops demonstrating competence, those underneath him will lose confidence. Now, this isn't the only thing that's notable about this chapter. I want to show you next where Christ comes into the picture and why Jesus's vision for leadership is so much more compelling and convincing and so much deeper than what Machiavelli puts forward here, even in terms of the impact that Jesus's teaching on leadership has for our ability to choose our staff. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. All right, so we're looking at chapter 22 of The Prince, and we read this. To enable a prince to form an opinion of his servant, there is one test which never fails. When you see the servant thinking more of his own interests than of yours, and seeking inwardly his own profit in everything, such a man will never make a good servant, nor will you be ever able to trust him, because he who has the state of another in his hands ought never to think of himself, but always of his prince, and never pay attention to matters in which the prince is not concerned. Now, how do you apply this, right, to our world of today? and to those who are on your team. You know, I think that obviously there's a way you could refine this instead of talking about the prince, talking about the organization, right? Because then actually we, the leaders, have to be followers as well, followers of the organization, followers of the spirit or the mission that's been entrusted to us that we're there to enforce, we're there to enhance, we're there to defend and protect the vision that Thomas Aquinas gives of the king in De Regno, which is his writing on the king, 
He actually says that the best of the leaders will be those who serve the common good, serve what is shared, so that every member of the group benefits. They're there, in a sense, the king as the number one servant of the rest. And of course, we think about our Lord and what he himself demonstrated to us, saying that the greatest among you will be the, the least of all and the servant of all, right? And, and that, in fact, is the truth from the Catholic perspective of what leadership is all about. And, and here you've got the demonstration of where Machiavelli falls short, right? For him, it's all about the prince and the loyalty of the servant towards the prince. And, and the, almost as if the prince is the be-all and end-all instead of the organization or the common good being really the focus of the prince's effort, the prince has no one to whom he is relative. Isn't that a wonderful example, in just a wonderful, just black and white drawing of what is wrong with Machiavelli's thinking? Machiavelli, in the end, makes the prince an absolute and therefore power as an absolute even over any kind of moral law or teaching. And aren't we all tempted to do this with our own lives? Every time we, we justify our activities vis-a-vis -vis God's law, from not going to church on Sunday, to not going to confession for this or that, to being impure with this or that way, to you know, all the different ways that we can sin. And we just line them all up. And then we start to say, well, you know what? I, it's okay for me to do this because of this, right? I, I can justify this or that action that I'm doing by this or this reasoning, right? The, the end can justify the means, right? I, 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 in order for me to be happy, I have to do this. And in fact, even if that's immoral, and that justification can go really to, to great extremes, everyone. And in the end, it can sound kind of silly, but it has all of it at the same, the same root. And that is that we make ourselves to be God. We make ourselves to be an absolute and we forget that we ourselves are called to be servants. Wouldn't it be something if the prince himself were to try to be towards his God, what the prince wants his teammate or his servant, so to speak, his staff person to be towards his organization? Right? In other words, what if the prince were to not seek his own profit in everything, but instead always seek the good of what Christ himself was asking him to do? It'd be a very different vision. Instead of becoming an absolute, the prince would see his authority as being relative, relative to Christ. Right? And this is what we're called to do. When Jesus gives us places of authority from a spot at the bedside of a sick person to the role of a scientist advancing nuclear energy to a desk of a manager trying his best or her best to meet the goals for this next quarter. Whatever the role of authority that we have to a mom doing the laundry over and over again, that role of authority has been given to us for our sanctification so that by executing with the greatest skill and passion and fidelity that we can, the charges that we've been entrusted by our great king and our leader, the one whom we serve, will we become stewards of his grace and his goodness. And we let his light shine and his goodness be known through our stewardship. So the idea of a Christian king is that the Christian king is the slave of the king of kings and that the king of kings rules through the kingship of the Christian king, right? Or the Christian queen. And this is the beautiful thing. Everywhere you're a king or you're a queen, you've been sent there by Christ. What are we to do? I'm not to make myself an absolute. I am to be towards Christ. What I want my number one teammate, number one staffer to be towards me. Faithful, supportive, helpful, ready. You know, you can think of the different qualities of a great teammate and wouldn't that be the same, the great qualities of a great leader with respect to Christ, to form the heart, to not be the be all and end all, 
because I've been given a place of importance in this world. One of the biggest traps for those who have success and wealth is to think that they are successful because of their success or wealth. Instead, to, wouldn't it, the, the vision that Christ in, instructs us to have is that everything that we've been given, we've been given as a steward to take care of, to make fruitful in the service of someone far greater than us. We are not the sum of what we possess or what people think that we have. We are the sum of what God thinks of us and what God has given us. And those are all gifts that come on the inside. And so, you know, the, he goes on, you know, in his chapter here, Machiavelli, and he talks about how, you know, in order to keep the prince, uh, the servant honest, the prince needs to share with him his own, you know, honors and his own cares so that the person stays faithful to him because he sees that the prince himself is not grasping over everything but is sharing his life with him. What a wonderful insight that is. How true that is to this day. All of us who have roles that where we follow people know that, you know, the thing that makes us follow them is when we feel like they trust us and that we're a part of what they're doing, that we're part of something bigger than them. Well, I want to just put that and, and have that perspective of ourselves with respect to the Lord. When I look at myself and the Lord, don't I see that the Lord is sharing his cross with me, his glory with me? And shouldn't I then turn to those who are around me and do the same? Uh, the, the spirituality of communio is found in the spirituality of service. By service I, to God, I open myself to true communion and solidarity with those around me. This is a, a pattern that the Lord himself sets forth for us and one we need to follow. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.